Good evening. Oh, I'm ready. <laughs> Let me know when you're ready. Are we good? Good evening. Uh, it's May 14th, 5.31 p.m. Welcome to the uh, regular meeting of the Evergreen Public Schools Board of Directors. Please rise with me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Our uh, student representative, uh, Sullivan Taylor, has our land acknowledgement. Evergreen Public Schools resides on the traditional lands of the Chinookan peoples in the Cowlitz tribe. They have lived on and cared for this land and its waterways since time immemorial. We thank them for their stewardship and make this acknowledgement to open a space of recognition, inclusion, and respect for all indigenous students, families, and staff in our community. Thank you. The next item is to adopt the agenda for tonight. I move that we adopt the agenda as presented. Second. Director Weatherspoon moves and uh, Director Bocanegra seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Is Director Grunwald online? I am. Okay. <laughs> nice. I knew you were here. Let's recognize that, that Director Grunwald is here remotely um, uh, for the meeting. Um, and the agenda is adopted. The next item on our agenda is a treat. Uh, we are to, uh, we have the York Elementary School Marimba Club uh, here to perform with us, or for us, and for the community. Anna's from York. She's going to introduce uh, her, uh, her ensemble. Welcome, Eliana. Do I go right now? Um, good evening. My name is Eliana, and I'm a member of the York Elementary Marimba Club. Our, Mar our Marimba Club is made up of fourth and fifth grade students. Our teacher is Mrs. Morell. We meet after school two times a week, and we've met about 12 times in total. Today, we will be performing two tunes for you today. Our first piece is fun and fast-paced. We hope you enjoy STG. Thank you.
Our second piece has a Caribbean feel and you'll hear an A and a B section. Thank you so much for allowing us to perform for you this evening. We hope you enjoy Hidden Treasure. Great job, guys. Great job. Thank you for coming in and enjoyed so it tremendously. Impressed. This is so great to see. Thank you for sharing this with us. Yeah. That was happy music. Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Getting that time of year. So we'll recess for a minute or two while the marimbas roll out. Yeah. Three minutes.
Thank you. Ready? Okay, we'll come back to order then. I, yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you for arranging that and, and for uh, letting the kids perform. It was wonderful to see. Uh, the next item on our agenda is our public comment section. Any community, any community member wishing to address the board may do so during the designated time on the agenda for public comments. Comments are to be directed to the Board of Directors as a whole and may not be addressed to any individual member of the Board, the administrative staff, or the audience. Although the Board will not engage in dialogue, the Board Chair may ask a speaker a clarifying question or follow up at a later time on an issue raised during public comment. Each speaker has a maximum of three minutes this evening. After, um, let's see, we have eight speakers. Uh, which would go to, okay, so we can set aside just a half an hour uh, for this one. And then we'll close comments and move forward with the rest of the meeting. There is no mechanism whereby a speaker can donate some or all of their time to another speaker. No individual may speak more than once per regular meeting, even if there is time remaining. Please state your name and district affiliation, if any. Uh, the first uh, sign up that we have on our list is uh, Carrie McGarry. Carrie, are you here? When I found out I was following uh, mm -hmm. entertainment, I figured I'd better bring a present. So I only brought five of these because I thought there were only five board members, but I do have something for you. Um, I'm Um, okay, so I've been teaching for 30 years, um, 11 in the Evergreen School District, and the, um, over those 30 years, the mental health of our students um, has deteriorated um, exponentially. Um, anxiety, depression, um, goodness, I have a timer making me all nervous. Um, so those types of things um, are preventing all kinds of learning, and I believe um, that cell phones are a huge part of this deterioration of our students' mental health. Um, I would like to suggest that the board consider a cell phone ban for the Evergreen School District. The book that I just gave you um, 
provides years of research on how cell phones and social media and the um, access to unfettered access to the internet is um, damaging our children. And um, it has incredible stories. It's a super easy read. Um, and um, it changed my life after reading it. it. Sounds kind of silly, but as an educator, I can't unsee some of the things that um, dis is discussed in this classroom, or in this classroom, in this book. And um, I see those kids in my classroom, the addictions um, that they have with cell phones. Um, in Mountain View, um, Mr. Anthony, our principal, has tried to enforce um, a cell phone ban, but all it did was make the teachers policemen um, 35 times a day. I asked students to put their cell phones away. And um, wonderful kids, but that cell phone's in their pocket. I asked them to put it in their backpacks. It comes back out. They just can't um, resist the urge, and myself as an adult, I also have that same issue with the cell phones. And um, But I'm not going through puberty. My brain's um, developed, I hope, <laughs> at this point. Um, but I think there's a lot of damage that's doing, um, that is happening to kids because of cell phones and social media. So I would like you to read this book, and um, if you haven't already, and when you're hiring a new superintendent, um, if you would keep that in mind and hopefully look for someone that would have the courage um, and the bravery to actually implement or follow the blueprint that is in this book on how to um, ban cell phones within a school district and provide services for students um, to help them improve their mental health. And I appreciate you taking the time to um, to listen to me and to, for your consideration in the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McGarry. <laughs> Angie Bender, are you here? Um, can I add one more thing really quickly? The name of the book is The Anxious Generation, for anybody who wants to read it. Okay, she said the name of the book is Anxious Generation. <clears throat> Hello, Happy Angie. Year. This is not going to be fun, but it keeps getting mentioned and it needs to be said. So, uh, okay, here we go. Um, it's been a tense couple months for everyone. It's definitely showing. I'm sure that most of you were hoping that Victoria would be reelected, but the community was ready for change and new ideas. And although I know not everyone has the same opinions as the newest board member, many stakeholders have noticed a recent growing lack of professionalism, respect, and civility toward this member and the public. Whether it be obvious looks of disdain, or rolling your eyes, it's noticed. Or being extremely snappy, snide, and curt with your words to toward those who ask questions and have ideas that don't fall into line with the norm of how the district has been run for the past 15 years, it's hurt. Or, literally saying into the microphone a challenge to the community that voted you in, no, I want them to hear me. Let, me let them tell me I'm rude. It's not forgotten, and it's not in compliance with your school board mission or your code of conduct. For those in the community who don't know policy GC1, it states the Evergreen Public Schools Board of Education represents, leads, and serves the community and holds itself accountable to them by committing to act in their best interest and by ens ensuring that all board and district action is consistent with the law and the board's policies. And GC7, Board Members Code of Conduct says, the board and its members will conduct themselves lawfully with integrity and high ethical standards in order to model the behaviors expected of staff and students and to build the public confidence and credibility. Members will exercise personal discipline in the performance of their duties, including proper use of authority and appropriate decorum when acting as board members. On top of some of you being rude to fellow board members, the majority of you have completely stopped responding to stakeholders and refused to set up meetings. This is the only forum that the public has to address you and you cannot reply to them, which again is a lack of communication. Uh, my thoughts to fix this would be every so often, say once a month, hold a workshop after the meeting specifically to be a town hall type interactive forum where the community can engage with all of you together and rebuild the relationship that we're desperately trying to develop with the people who are supposed to speak and act on our behalf. 
if you are already meeting, you're already getting paid to be together, why not make one of your workshops an opportunity to engage the public, to speak to them, to show them that they're heard, and to work together to try and find solutions. So even though our group has been called negative, I'd like you to think of the district as a boat with a lot of holes. And people have not been looking at the holes. They've been avoiding the holes and ignoring them. And to have people call out the holes doesn't mean that they want to sink the boat. They're trying to patch the holes so we can all float. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. David Bennett. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Bennett. Um, I am a parent of a total of six children in the district going back to 2007, and my youngest will be graduating in 2035. So uh, quite the breadth. I have a lot of a vested interest in making sure that the board and the school district is uh, run and operated effectively for my children. Um, I'm not going to talk about all six tonight. I'm going to talk about my two youngest. Um, they are both deaf with cochlear implants, and they were part of the centralized deaf and hard of hearing program. Now, about a year ago, um, this board um, and the superintendent made a very controversial and difficult decision to go to a neighborhood program. And I'm here to say thank you. Uh, both of my two deaf and hard of hearing children are now at their local school instead of being put on a bus and shipped off to a centralized location, um, different from their peers, different from their neighbors, um, they now walk to school. They see their friends. They see their friends that they live by. Uh, after school on Friday, when it was, what, 117 degrees outside, uh, we brought otter pops, and the families got together on the playground with their friends that they live by in the school that they go to. Now, I'm not going to say that it hasn't been a difficult challenge, and I'm not going to say that it's been easy for either of my two deaf children, um, but it has, instead of shipping them off on a bus to a centralized location away from their neighbors and their friends, um, it has created a, an environment, an inclusive environment, a place where they can go and be with their friends and their family without being shipped off somewhere away from their neighbors and their friends. Um, I, I want to say that part of the reason that, the, that this has been such a success for my children has been the support that the board has provided to the local administration at our neighborhood school to not just here go and then let them run free. Instead, they have provided the appropriate paraeducators, they have provided the appropriate administrative staff, and they have provided the support for my children's teachers to actually engage with my deaf children. Um, the teachers actually teach the other children in class ASL so that my kids could communicate a little bit better with them. They both have cochlear implants, so they both speak generally okay, um, but they also communicate bilingually with ASL and with spoken language. And this neighborhood program and the support that the board has provided has allowed my children to be so much more engaged with their community. Community, um, than being put on a bus and shipped off to a centralized location where they're, they're different than everyone else. Now they're the same, they're regular, old, everyday, normal kids who also happen to be deaf with cochlear implants. And that's a big difference and it will, for them in the long run, help them to be part of a community that is local to their neighborhood. And I appreciate um, what you did last year and I appreciate the ongoing support that you have provided with your neighborhood deaf and hard of hearing programs. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Bennett. Lindsay Morales. Lindsay, did I pronounce your name correctly? Morales, okay. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lindsay Morales. I'm a teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing in our district, and I love my job. Um, I'm also a parent in the district. Today I'm speaking on behalf of the elimination of programs in our district. We need programs. We need programs for multilingual learners, students on the spectrum, students with varying degrees of developmental or intellectual disabilities, programs for students with um, 
who need social and emotional support before they can be expected to succeed academically. We need programs for students with behavior needs where they can learn self-love and empathy before they can function in a society in healthy ways. We need programs for students who benefit from project-based learning, students who are deaf and hard of hearing, students who are highly capable. At the high school level, we tout our multiple pathways to graduation, but we need multiple pathways through elementary and middle school as well. We need programs. Legally, the IDEA says that we need to provide a continuum of alternative placements. Our current model unravels decades of advocacy work, and it's not working. A gen ed teacher cannot be the multi-language specialist, the special education teacher, the counselor, the behavior specialist, teach the highly capable, and now be the librarian, and teach the gen ed curriculum in order, in a set time frame, all at the same time. One of the big issues with the adoption of the neighborhood schools model is that we did not change our instructional model. Currently, teachers have predetermined curriculum that they have to teach certain lessons in order on certain days and in very rigid time blocks. This does not work if half the class cannot access the curriculum, needs more time, differentiation, scaffolding, specialized instruction or accommodations to get through it. You cannot expect this model of instruction and also expect universal design for learning, UDL. This cannot exist at the same time. You can't have it both ways. UDL is defined by flexible schedules, alternative curriculum, multiple ways into the learning, multiple ways to show one's learning, and being genuinely responsive to the needs of the students and classroom community. You've also eliminated alternative and therapeutic settings, which means that students are having outbursts in classrooms, in community spaces, behaving violently, and disrupting those students who do benefit from the typical gen ed experience. Students are throwing um, chairs, desks, tables, knocking down shelves, screaming, crying, pounding on walls, Teachers are being punched, kicked in the groin. They've had sprained wrists, broken glasses, and more. And instead of providing a safe and therapeutic setting for children who escalate, our current model instead has the rest of the class evacuate so that the child who's escalated can stay and trash the classroom. Have you ever been in a classroom that, um, where children have had to evacuate because it is no longer safe? Have you ever seen the look on these children's faces? We're creating trauma. Legally, we're also obligated to provide instruction to students who qualify for highly capable. These students are not getting what they need by this myth of Excel clusters. My daughter did not get any Excel cluster instruction in elementary school, and the same is true this year in middle school. Eliminating programs means we are no longer supporting students who are highly capable, and we're not supporting students who have the highest needs. We need our leadership to take accountability. I'm we sorry need, to say, the time has expired. And we need... Um, teachers to return to having autonomy in their classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Morales, if you were unable to finish all your comments, I invite you to send them to board directors at evergreenps.org, uh, and we'll read them in full. The next person on uh, uh, the public comment sign up is Catherine Furtick. Good evening. Good evening. Let me get my stuff in order here, please. Good evening. My name is Catherine Furtick. I have two children um, left in EPS. I want to genuinely thank you for restoring us back to three minutes to speak, to share with you. The absolute last thing I want to do is come before you bringing negativity. Your job as elected board members carries an immense amount of responsibility and pressure. You all have busy lives and families with your own personal stressors. This does not leave my mind. Three minutes is difficult enough to fit in significant concerns and cutting time down to two minutes left me feeling there was no room for niceties. All our statements became sound bites and I have often felt critical and unpleasant. This is the last thing I want to do. It's the last thing many of us want to do. I would genuinely like to know what prompted the desire to attempt to cut the time down permanently due to the importance and significant impact of the loss of librarians, security and music programs, along with vital support staff, the public comment numbers increased. This dramatic increase should have been a clear indication that our voices were not adequately allowed to be heard on such a far reaching topic and impact. How are your voting constituents supposed to share important matters in such a short time. Is that the point, that you are tired of hearing us speak out so much and so often? 
I grant that there will never feel like enough time, but regarding the attempt to covertly revise it to two minutes, the stakeholders have a right to ask why. Yes, the board has the right to determine the amount of time, but why cutting it now? Why at all? The timing had an outright retaliatory feel to it. We are grateful that what you refer to as an error was amended, but witnessing the attempt has unfortunately created more distrust, not less, and the language used in the attempted revision gave me a taste of what our staff and feel and experience with the staff expression policy that was signed in last year. There has been a noted negative and retaliatory atmosphere permeating the school climate for our staff. Just enough vagueness and up to interpretation language and policies to keep employees quiet. It is because of this I'm compelled to speak. I represent more than my own voice. I represent those who feel they can't risk speaking out. The current teaching, learning, and volunteering environment of our schools is extremely negative, often traumatic, and downright unsafe. The amount of superintendents we've had in such a short time has not contribute, contributed to a positive atmosphere. The disconnect, and not as bad as it sounds, mentality of upper administration is a gross distortion of putting on a happy face. In order to change anything for the good, we have to name the problems. We don't want to be stuck in that place of criticizing. We desire positive change. We want to work with you and move forward together. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Tori Ward. It's a long trip. Hi, y'all. Um, I'm Corey Ward. I have five kids in the school district. I volunteer in my children's schools very frequently. I'd like to begin by acknowledging credit where it's due. Since students and community members uh, spoke out about the lack of visits from board members outside of required events like breakfast with the board, we have seen two of our board members and even our superintendent in the schools. It's really good to see you guys there. But this needs to become the normal and not the exception. And I hope the other board members follow their example and maintain visits in the school. On to community concerns. <laughs> First one being librarians and paras. Speaking of visits, during one board member's visit, they spoke after of the importance of and incredible efforts of our paras and librarians. It then calls into question, why were they thus deemed the least bad decision to cut if they are so important and incredible? As spoken by two of our previous speakers, the amount of work that paras do is invaluable, especially in the neighborhood school model. Of our current 22 elementary librarians, 19 are transitioning back into the cat, back into the classroom. What is actually being saved here? We have new non-student facing positions being created here at the district, and we're told they're being paid they, what they are to keep it competitive and attractive, but these positions are not posted or applied for as they are typically filled internally. Who then are you keeping it competitive and attractive for, or is it just what you tell us to justify not spending our money on our children? Community concern, actions and words. Speaking with principals and teachers, they are so appreciative of parents and community members who are willing to volunteer, help, and work together, and as such, they provide opportunities for us to collaborate and work with them. Their words and actions are matching. You as a school board have stated you want to come together to collaborate, yet are giving no actions to encourage or even attempt to do so. If you actually want collaboration and coming together, why are you giving no actions to back up these words? We want to collaborate. You've heard it said numerous times already, we don't want the boat to sink, we want to work together. But y'all aren't working with us. We're trying to work with you. We're trying to let our voices be heard. Community concern, staff expression policy 5254. Every meeting, we start with a pledge to that flag for, and for the Republic of which it stands. Our First Amendment right is the freedom of speech. All staff policy expression 5254 does is limit and inhibit the free speech our teachers have. To what end do you want your teachers and staff silenced? If you do not want your actions spoken of, of, stop doing the actions that you are ashamed of and afraid of being spoken of. It was signed and implemented into policy last year. And so I suggest our superintendent before he leaves either repeal it or explain why he is comfortable infringing on his staff's First Amendment right. And final community concern is the school start times. Last board meeting, we heard plans to meet with transportation to discuss adjusting start times back to previous, the previous school year. Do we have any news of those changes here? I know I'm not the only parent asking this. In addition to academic attendance effect, an interesting place I discovered volunteering in the schools this week is the cafeteria, where they are left scrambling to make sure every student is fed as late times come in. This issue has not been this much magnitude in previous years. The new start times have only had negative impacts and I urge us to return to the previous year. So please let us know how those meetings with transportation are going. Thank you. Thank you for your comments.
The next speaker is Camille Lohman. Camille, are you here? Good evening. My name is Camille, and while I do have a student in the district, I, that's not really why I come to the board meetings every month. Uh, and much of this has been sent to you in an email, but I want to ensure that the tone matches the intent. So following the EEA's vote of no confidence, there was significant chatter from the community about their own vote of no confidence. And the admin team of the Red for Ed parent group was asked to lead the charge. We have approached this very carefully as not wanting to risk, the developing, uh, risk developing a relationship and partnership with the board and district leadership as that is necessary for student success. And the success of EPS students is the end goal I believe we can all agree that we are aligned on. So we made a survey. We structured the survey like an anonymous public comment during board meetings with the only demographic question being district affiliation. With well over 200 individual responses, we have a significant amount of data that we look forward to sharing with you uh, so you can compare the results to feedback that you receive directly and at board meetings. And then we can all address together these common themes of community concerns. We wanted to ensure that if a vote of no confidence were to occur, that it was very representative of our diverse community with an opportunity for stakeholders to provide feedback, not just those within the Facebook group. And after reviewing the results from the survey, it would be our recommendation to the community that a formal vote of no confidence is not necessary if the constructive criticism from the survey is taken seriously by leadership. While many believe that a formal vote of no confidence holds no weight, the court of public opinion is strong, and if leadership continues to treat the community as bystanders rather than an important part of student success, the students will be the ones who suffer. Community trust cannot begin to rebuild unless those in leadership positions choose to respond genuinely rather than a copy-paste response containing nothing more than a thanks or messages that are very obviously AI, which are being perceived by, by many as unsettling and disingenuous. Please note that if you choose to not address these consistent community concerns, the non-action would be evidence of non-compliance with at least Operation Ex Expectations 8.4 and 8.13. I want to stress that this comment is meant to strictly be for transparency and accountability. I believe we are all in agreement that leaders who lack accountability cannot lead successfully. And the strategic plan that the district has spent very much money on calls for strong leadership. Providing the community with the opportunity to have a voice and to actually feel heard in a way that doesn't feel like screaming into a void with nothing more, with not even an echo back, doesn't feel like. Uh, being heard, and it's a responsibility of district leadership to provide this. Um, neglecting to incorporate the vital aspect of parent and community involvement into the strategic plan is an oversight, oversight by, and the community is experiencing doubt in the efficacy of the strategy. And the rest is in the email, and I really hope we can connect. Thank you for your comments. Rose Wombold. Good evening. My name is Rose Wombold, a resident of Vancouver and a concerned taxpaying voting citizen. I'm here to speak on behalf of the school aged children concerning Bill 5462. In previous school board meetings, I've expressed my concerns about Bill 5462, which states inclusive education. However, the context weighs very heavily on the side of the LGBTQ plus education. Rhetorically, I am asking this question, what will that look like in 2025, October? According to Ingros Senate Bill 5462, Chapter 157, Laws of 2024, 68th Legislature, Section 1 states, the legislature acknowledges that school districts are required to adopt a policy related to the selection or removal of instructional materials. Under state rule, the instru instructional materials policy of each school district must establish and use appropriate screening criteria to identify and eliminate bias pertaining to, pro to protect classes. This tells me 
the ball remains in the school board's court. It's your decision, ultimately. The curriculum will be ultimately approved by, school board, by the school board. You all have this flexibility. My next rhetorical question to each of you school board members, have you educated yourself with the context of Bill 5462 so that each of you may make a responsible decision for each of the school board children in District 114? The bill is due to come into effect October 2025. However, as we know, the footwork is in progress now. May I remind each of you that this curriculum highly targeting LGBTQ plus education, starting with the kindergartners, will be weighed on the scales of your eternal lives. Truly, what we need in our schools is back to basics. Structure, predictability, discipline, and accountability. To learn kindness and care for others, themselves, and their country. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Having heard all of the uh, uh, citizens who've signed up for public comment, we'll go ahead and close that portion of the meeting. The next item on the agenda is the board consent agenda. Action requires a motion. I move for approval of the board consent agenda. Second. Moved by Director Bocanegra, seconded by Director Wilson. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing no opposition, uh, the agenda is, is passed. Next item on the agenda is the superintendent's consent agenda. Is there a motion? I move that we adopt the agenda as, uh, as presented. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to adopt the superintendent's consent agenda. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. And any opposed? Motion carries. I'm just getting myself to the right spot. Okay, the next item on the agenda is a presentation um, entitled Building Condition Assessments. Is Nicole Daltoso here? Hi, Nicole. Good evening. All right. I'm Nicole Daltosa, the Senior Director of Capital Facilities here for beautiful Evergreen Public Schools. And I'm going to be going over a very exciting topic, asset preservation programs. So my area are buildings. Um, so we'll just kind of hop into it here. So um, asset preservation applies to state-funded assisted buildings that were built after 1993. So pretty much any building in our inventory prior to that is not really covered by this, um, but we'll get into the details of how we still assess those buildings. The districts must self-report annually on the condition of the qualifying buildings, and then every sixth year we have a certified third-party assessor um, update OSPI via the Inventory of Conditions of Schools, which we shorthand call it ICOS. And then the results are presented to the board. Um, so basically when a school that has been state funded comes into the inventory, once it's been accepted, meaning closeout is completed, the board has accepted it closed, it starts a 30 year time clock. And then on those six years is when we have a certified assessment done. Every other year it's self-assessed in house by maintenance and facility staff. The minimum data to be reported to OSPI includes the building condition scores and changes to the building inventory. And then the graph on the side is really just to show a sample building depreciation chart. So 
your optimum, your minimum, and then if you're really deficient, you're not really maintaining your buildings well. So furthermore, um, OSPI manages ICOS, which is that statewide database for maintaining records of the inventory in ICOS. And um, the data is intended to also assist districts with providing insight about our asset conditions. It helps us monitor and identify potential maintenance or capital renewals. So it basically gives that baseline when you start, like, hey, we're at 100%, brand new building, and then each year we have, you know, maintenance things that come up. But it also gives us that idea of, like, ooh, we have HVAC systems that are coming up to end of life, which then also helps us, as it says, prepare for some capital renewal. So individual building condition scores represent a snapshot in time of the estimated overall asset condition. And basically what that means is in that moment that we're doing the assessment, that's, that's the moment we're looking, that's the moment we're scoring. So it can vary throughout the year. It can vary um, even in that whole six year period before it gets its first certified assessment. Then you have another set of eyes coming in, that third party coming in, and is going to see the, the building in a different light than we, even how we see it internally. The um, building scores are calculated by factoring a weighted average of the scores for the overall individual building component. So for example, when you're walking into a building and we're scoring on the building, the condition of the ceilings um, or the T-grid, um, in this room, looks fantastic, let's say. We go to another part of the building, it's kind of in some rough condition. Another portion of the building, classrooms, it looks great, but this hallway has, you know, we, we see some water damage. We take that average overall, so if it's great overall, you're gonna see a higher weighted score. So once again, the conditions are impacted by several factors, including just the natural weathering, how it's being used, and also the general depreciation over time. How is it being maintained and operated? Obviously, capital renewals um, may have been updated or renewed major systems, and all of that is going to affect those scores. Um, and then those scores are recalibrated by certified professionals on that every sixth year. So the big thing about this is, for example, with that snapshot in time, well, you'll see in the scores, like we have some capital renewal projects that are still pending at, for example, Illahee and Harmony. And so at the time that those scores were being collected, we had to consider that they weren't finished yet. So those will still show low, but when we go through next year and do our internal assessment, we will then document that those renewal projects were completed and that will then bump that score up for those systems. So I think it's important to note our building inventory in general, and I always love to throw these larger numbers out because it gives that full picture of what, what we maintain and what we deal with. So we have a total of 3,196,183 square feet, total school building square footage. So that's everything we gotta maintain, and that's just square footage. 175,000 of that is our total school portable square footage, but it's important to note that obviously all of our portables are not currently occupied. Um, we have quite a few that are just there. We're you know, working on kind of getting rid of that inventory because obviously we've built some new buildings. We gotta get that inventory out. It's also important to note too that portables do not count towards the asset preservation program. They're not included in that, they're, they're separate. Of the buildings that we have, 1,749 million are covered by the asset preservation program. So meaning that those buildings, um, we received state assisted funds, also known as SCAP, or the School Construction Assistance Program, and they were built after that December 31st, 1993, or time frame when that started. So to note though, for any school that is not covered, that wasn't paid for out of SCAP, that wasn't state funded, the district still performs an annual assessment on those buildings. 
Um, that's something that's not required by OSPI, but some school districts, and Evergreen has chosen to do so, will choose to do assessments on those buildings. It's a great way to record what we're seeing in that snapshot in time. And it helps us then go, okay, we know we need to do X, Y, Z projects at these schools and these schools, and we'll have these upcoming in the next three to five years or what have you. Emerald, Y East, and Mountain View, kind of in our new, you know, our new buildings, those were not SCAP funded, so those we, we will still just do internally. Burton and Mill Plain, when you're looking at the list, they're not on the list yet because those projects aren't closed out with the state. So once those are closed out, it could be because, for example, at Burton there was a lot of commissioning, building commissioning, so on the HVAC system and controls that, is, or that are still ongoing. We want that to be absolutely dialed in and perfect before we accept that project. And then at that point when it's accepted, that starts the 30 year time clock for OSPI. Here's how the score rating matrix works. It's really interesting because you have to keep in mind, it's also kind of subjective on who's looking at it. Like I might think like, wow, that ceiling looks wonderful. Another person comes in, meh, I'm gonna score it at a good. So that's why it's so important to have those every six years certified ones, because you're getting that other set of eyes in. Um, plus, we see our buildings all the time, and eventually you get used to what you're looking at. So the New York Excellent is like 195%, so when we have a new building coming in, we usually will push a new building down to a good after about two years. That's when we start to see like, okay, we're getting, oh, there's a roof leak there, like let's get that repaired. You'll start to see that use and wear and tear. And then it goes down to fair and you can see the rest of it. Um, so most of our EPS buildings are in the good range, which is awesome. And then anything that does land in that, for, that fair range, it's really due to age at that point. So this is just a quick snapshot of the scores um, that we had for the buildings um, that went through a certified building condition assessment this year. We had 15 locations completed and due for their certifieds. Um, and so you can see the scores there. For our certified assessments, um, we contracted with Mang Analysis who completed the assessments for us. And it was, it was honestly, it was really great project um, to work with them on. It was super eye-opening for me, um, having been with the district just over a year, to be able to see some of our building systems with a different set of eyes and having somebody else say, hey, have you noticed this? And being like, had no idea. Um, so it's amazing to have those partnerships and be able to depend on our partners and even staff and admin who are like, hey, we have this thing. Um, need that information, because obviously I cannot be in every square footage of the building at one time. So with that, I'm gonna transition it over to Timothy Buckley from Ming Analysis to kind of go over how that certified assessment went for us. Good evening. Good evening, thank you. Um, uh, members of the board, uh, Superintendent Boyd. Um, wanted to uh, provide some highlights from what we were seeing um, in the field um, and uh, also some comparisons, but before I do that, I'm gonna jump back to York based on what we heard from the students there. I thought I'd bring in uh, a little bit of perspective from what they're seeing, that uh, that building was completed in 2003. So it's what, 21 years old. It was one of the first prototypes of the 2000 era prototypes. And the score, um, I'm gonna go backwards here, one, you'll see uh, was 86. 0.24, so that's an, actually a good score. So consider um, a building 21 years old that's still performing at a, at a good level. Um, and you're gonna see that as a, as a common theme. We also wanted to pull some sampling of uh, just a, a few comparative scores over time. So the prior building condition assessment scores, and these were by the certified assessor? Yes. So six years previous. So Pioneer, uh, built in 1993, so that's on the edge of when the reporting uh, is to occur. So that's a, a pretty old school. Still 79.5 as a score, so that is in the fair range, just a, just a tad under good. And a lot of um, 
the capital investments that you've made to help improve the condition over time, as well as real, really good maintenance staff, um, taking attention to that was, was really evident uh, from what I was seeing. Um, and you're gonna see the same thing for Fisher's Landing. Um, and then um, I know there's gonna be some HVAC work that's gonna be coming up, so expect to see those scores actually rise in the future when um, you go through this process um, internally with staff um, coming up. Uh, Frontier, uh, 1997. Um, so again, a lot of recent capital improvements helped improve the score. So really good care of your assets. Uh, and you're seeing that reflected in the total overall score. Um, Re-roof, new carpet, security systems, and new furnishings. Those all help improve um, the conditions of that, of that facility and obviously help improve the, uh, the teaching and learning environment. Uh, Heritage, 1999, um, also uh, capital improvements. Um, and then what you don't see is an HVAC um, upgrade that's gonna be apparently occurring this summer. Yep. So again, that was a snapshot in time. Those scores should jump when staff uh, does these reviews uh, this next year. Some of the uh, common uh, deficiencies that we were seeing, uh, skylights, uh, a, a, a translucent panel system exposed to ultraviolet radiation, sunlight, weathering. Um, we're seeing those start to degrade with panel warp and yellowing and some of the um, uh, coating on the surface of that starting to peel off. That was a common, common issue. Other various HVAC issues, um, some mechanical equipment that do probably want to have a, a, a tune-up um, or ret what we also refer to as retro commissioning to make sure that they're operating at their optimal um, uh, performance measures um, that they can. And then some of those mechanical units are just at, at end of life and we're seeing some of that. Some of the buildings with especially brick, uh, we're experiencing some efflorescence. And by, in fact, I had a couple of uh, instances where staff were concerned, not realizing what efflorescence is. It's when moisture um, uh, finally makes its way through a masonry wall, it brings and dissolves some of the salts with it. And you'll see that on the interior surface of some uh, usually brick, um, uh, uh, brick wall systems. So you have this sort of white powder crystallization as the salt recrystallizes once it hits the uh, internal, internal air. And so it just looks uh, it's an aesthetic issue, it's not a health safety uh, concern, which is what staff was worried about. Uh, so there are several instances of that, and that can be addressed, and it was something that we discussed um, with the maintenance staff as well. And then we have other er areas where we have some examples of uh, windows where the seals are starting to f uh, fail. Um, you've got um, uh, a doubly glazed windows, they have a life a lifespan, and when the seal fails, you're going to see a sort of a rainbow discoloration or a fog on the inside of the window. It looks like it's dirty, but it, that's a failed, uh, a failed seal. It's just a natural process of, of um, aging in those systems at end of life. Um, and then other instances where there's wire glass in some of the older buildings especially, that's now considered a safety hazard because if, if someone impacts it, they can get injured um, removing a hand or, or other. So those are some of the uh, elements that uh, we identified as deficiencies shared with staff to make sure they're aware of those so that they can work on those uh, and help maintain facilities. Some other highlights. Um, I see a lot of school buildings throughout Washington State doing this work. And um, was really proud of the care that not only custodial staff at the district, but also your capital folks um, and maintenance staff are taking at a really good job of keeping up with maintenance and the activities to help um, maintain a really high quality of your building assets. Again, shows really good stewardship. And proactive, we would meet weekly and uh, review what we were finding in the field and uh, reporting back um, to staff. Um, and it was pretty amazing seeing work orders happening for some things that we were identifying that, you know, a failed a uh, failing pump, you know, we can hear that the, a bearing is going out that uh, no one else had noticed yet because you really have to climb in and around into attic spaces and, and such. Um, and other, other things like that, 
finding out the next week that it's either already been repaired or work order is in. Um, so again, just really impressed uh, with your staff on being proactive and maintaining um, those capital assets. Um, and then again, uh, just to recap how some of those scores have improved based on the capital investments that you guys have been making um, proactively. So replaced roofing, new security systems, the phone and PA systems, the clock systems, uh, new carpeting, and of course, regular coats of paint to cover up the, the, just the general wear and tear. Those were all um, really um, evident um, of uh, proactive um, activities going on. So just again, wanted to give you a little more perspective um, from what we were seeing as we did the um, assessment. All right, any questions? Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Um, you have a question? Yeah, um, I had sent an email, hadn't mm -hmm. heard back on it, but um, I know we were holding off, this is one piece of what we were looking at for um, school closure, mm -hmm. and we were holding off, and I, I just noticed 10 of the elementary schools are not on here and two of the middle schools. Of course, Y East is brand new and mm -hmm. um, Burton and Mill Plain. But the other ones, I'm wondering how we might do an assessment there to... Correct, so um, most of those schools were in the inventory prior to that 1993 date, so they won't be on the actual li list that you see. So those are the ones, but we are assessing them. Okay. So those are the ones that I was mentioning that we're still doing our internal assessment on them, and we can pull the data from ICOS to evaluate that as a consideration um, when we're diving into those discussions. And then, of course, um, why East obviously being new but not being state funded, it won't. Once again, it won't show up on that like master one that ICOS and OSPI will see and track. It will be done internally, and so we'll track that as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like you had mentioned, it's good to see we're taking care of our buildings. Out there. Yeah. Yes. And, and I want to thank you for uh, answering my question with resolution 60. Absolutely. Yeah. That one's a confusing one. So I was happy to help. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. And I also had a phone call from a constituent who asked about 1629 and uh, mm. actually a couple of pretty good ideas about land use that yeah. Uh, we went back and forth on that. I, and um, I can share more with you afterwards if you Absolutely. Like. Any other questions? I have a question about um, remodels. Mm -hmm. So if a remodel happens, does that reset the time clock or is it just considered the year it was built? It would pretty much be the year it was built, correct? Or it de here's the thing. It really depends. It's really that state funding piece. Mm -hmm. um, so if it is something that is state funded, it would be tracked on it, right? It would get added to that inventory for that particular building. That's, that's, that's correct. Yeah. And, and so if a building is remodeled, um, some of those systems in a building are going to be renewed and refreshed. That would be reflected in the scores. Sometimes other systems remain untouched and those also then have to get scored or sometimes we have to do a balance adjustment, you know, like, well, 25% of the building of that mm -hmm. particular system is brand new but 75% dates back to 1997. And so we have to kind of make some judgment in terms of how we average the score to reflect um, those systems within. So that would be the case like in Heritage where we added a building. Correct, but it wasn't because it wasn't that addition wasn't state funded. So that one doesn't part of this? Right, <laughs> yeah, so it's, yeah, it's a little bit, hmm, it just gets a little weird, basically. Yeah. Um, but if you're adding on, like with Heritage, it's a perfect example because the Adams building is, it's part of the inventory of Heritage, but it's also a separate building. Um, so now you're kind of tracking, it will show up on the list as Heritage, main building, Adams building. And then like Union, it shows up as each 500, 600, 800, like in each individual. Um, so if you were to add on, it basically gets added on to that, but you're assessing, and you would still be assessing them, but once again, main building's gonna have probably a lower score. Adams building will be at 100 um, until a couple years, and then 
it'll start to go down. So it's, you're assessing them still, but mm -hmm. separately. But together. That makes me wonder, I'm, now I'm thinking maybe, but does state um, construction funding have different rules for remodels? I don't even sure of that answer. It de I've seen it done multiple ways, to be honest with you. Honestly, it, on a remodel, you could, if you're moving, it's interesting. I mean, it's really a question for OSPI, but it's interesting. If you're like, for example, moving a program in and eliminating, and I, I've seen this done at a previous school district, so bear with me. Um, we were closing a building, moving them to another building that was that got a new building. So we were able to do it as a, what they call new in lieu. Um, and so because of how we were doing that shifting. Um, so in that scenario, it was then state funded for that remodel. Um, but I don't think, and that's not typical to how they applied that, to how OSPI would apply that. But it, it can be done basically. Nicole, <clears throat> you mentioned that we're going to be doing our own assessment on those, looks like about nine buildings. Mm -hmm. um, do you know when we might be able to get that? Done? Yeah, so I mean, we've completed um, this for this year's, those are done. So we can definitely pull the reports for that since I don't believe they wouldn't have been included in what you received. Um, so we can definitely pull those. Okay, good. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Director Grunwald, do you have any questions? Hearing none, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, yeah, thank, thank you, you Nicole, and thank you, Timothy. Appreciate uh, 3 million 100,000 square feet of uh, space. Um, and just, I know you mentioned our maintenance people. They don't get enough credit for the amazing job that we have a phenomenal maintenance department. And so uh, I'll be sure to reach out to Marty, Marietta, and, and uh, let him know to congratulate the guys for the great work that they're doing. And thank you for your leadership. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the teaching and learning department update. Uh, and underneath that is the special education update. Dr. Armstrong? It's superintendent report. Yes. I skipped another one. I keep doing that. I apologize. You're trying to skip me. I'm trying to skip you. <laughs> the next item is the superintendent report. <laughs> Thank you. I'll make Sorry. it quick. Uh, I had an opportunity to attend a roundtable at the Gates Foundation regarding uh, post-secondary uh, college success, where we had uh, two student leaders from Heritage High School and uh, Derek Garrison join me. Uh, to just look at research and, and talk with the uh, top state lead education leaders across the state. We did our own roundtable uh, recently at Cascade uh, Elementary School, or middle school, and uh, brought our own student uh, reps from each of our buildings to have a similar conversation. And so some of the learnings are that there's a common narrative and a popular narrative out there that um, you know, continuing education doesn't matter, that you can go straight from high school into good paying jobs. The research is really clear that every educational step that a student takes helps them in their life and their earnings potential and their happiness and, and success. So uh, it's something that we as a leadership team and our teaching and learning team is talking about, making sure that uh, we have our career counselors, our regular counselors and our, our leaders and our students are all talking about making sure that we have pathways to students to continue to get certifications, to continue to get their AA and BA along a pathway. So um, really interested in, in uh, seeing that work move forward as we uh, continue to challenge that narrative that continuing education doesn't matter for our students. Really proud of our two students, Liliana and Pablo and uh, uh, Derek Garrison for uh, leading that work. Uh, one of the things that we notice is that whenever we put students in a room together and we uh, take the time uh, to listen, uh, we learn lots. And we learned, uh, again, we had our final superintendent advisory, or excuse me, student advisory council meeting today that Sullivan helped lead. And, and I'd like to defer to you a little bit of time to talk about that uh, as I finish up here, give you a chance to gather your thoughts. 
Uh, but uh, we had our final combination with our students advocating for equity and our SAC team. Uh, Director Weatherspoon was able to join us and we talked about um, how they want to think about that process moving forward. They talked a little bit about what they wanted to, um, how they wanted to be involved in the superintendent search and then also some other things that I'll let uh, Sullivan talk about and then I'll come back to the mic. Hi, thank you. Um, we had a really great meeting today. We talked about um, some things that we're looking forward to for next year, um, such as replacing Covenant and I as student board reps as we graduate and um, going into next year's student advisory council and who we're looking for, what we're looking for in applicants. I think tomorrow we're looking to get the application sent out and um, we have an outline of our timeline and getting interviews and looking over the applications. Um, and we're really excited to see what's coming from that. And at our meeting today, we also spoke about um, just some closing things, how uh, our first year having a student advisory council went and um, what we're looking forward to next year. And the general consensus was that we need more time and that we love doing this and we want to continue doing this and have more meetings, more time, more team bonding. And um, everyone seemed really excited about going on for next year. And um, it's all great work. And I think that this year was a really great year to start. And we've created a really great base. And I think we're ready to jump into next year and make some more improvements. Thank you. And I'm just going to brag about Sullivan a little bit here. She leads those meetings. And it's a student-driven thing. And, and uh, she helps create the agendas, uh, works with uh, our uh, two representatives, uh, directors Bocanegra and Weatherspoon, and, and crafts those and leads the conversations and just does a phenomenal job. Covington usually is, Covenant's usually there too and ha wasn't able to today. But uh, appreciate that. And your leadership, we'll celebrate you a little bit um, later, but your leadership as the first uh, student board rep you and Covenant has been remarkable. So uh, we appreciate having your voice and all that you lend to our conversations and uh, really thank you for your leadership as well. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I also just want to thank you and the board and everybody who has supported Covenant and I through this, um, this be us being the first student board representatives in our district. Um, it's not the easiest thing, but I just love that we have so much support. And um, we have support through the other student board representatives throughout the state, which is just so wonderful. When we went to uh, Bellevue for our conference, we were able to meet with, I want to say, probably 100 other student board representatives from the state. And um, we've been able to create a really great community and bounce ideas off of each other. And um, it's just been so wonderful. And I'm so glad that I, Covenant and I have been able to uh, serve the students and that we've been able to help um, create a base and um, look forward for new opportunities for student voice. So we really thank both of you. Big, big, you. big, big shoes to fill for any students that choose to undertake that. So thank you. Um, just an update on the um, principal hiring. We have a lot of different uh, principal openings. We, of course, Sunset Elementary was filled by Laura uh, Buno. Uh, that created an opening at uh, Harmony, and uh, Brandy Anderson was chosen to, she was the associate principal there, and now will be the principal next year, chosen and pushed forward to the staff to me, and she was selected. Uh, Greg Brown uh, will take over Griffin Payton, who was um, chosen to be the senior director of instructional leadership here. So Greg Brown, congratulations to him. We had at interviews at Cascade today, so they'll have a candidate in my office or, or more to uh, discuss that part. We have interviews at Ellsworth on the 16th, which is two days from now. And of course, Greg Brown going to Union Creates and um, an opening at Shahela. And so um, I'll be joining our, our um, staff to um, go over there and talk to them about the leadership qualities they want to see in their next uh, 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 principal. So as we um, have moved principals around, it also creates a little bit of a domino effect. I want to congratulate our team, which has been just amazing. Uh, Bobby Height, Heather Fowler, uh, Kimberly Armstrong, and Janae Gom Gomes for doing just an incredible job of um, engaging with the staff ahead of time and then uh, getting students and staff involved in the selection process. So just an incredible uh, job and uh, just a big shout out to those folks that are helping us with that process. And that is my report. Thank you, John. Um, 
With respect to the student advisors, this probably is a question for both of you. Um, and the question becomes, what kind of supports do you need from the board in uh, the new onboarding process uh, for the new student reps after selection? Uh, right now, we're just looking to get our applications out, and I think that that responsibility is covered. Um, we're planning to host interviews. Um, I don't have the timeline pulled up just right now, but we're planning to host interviews for the student board representative position. So having ideally two board members there to help guide us and um, to help set a um, goal of what we're looking for. And I think that's about it. We have a really good baseline of what we're looking for. And um, the only other thing I could ask is just making sure that the word gets out that all of the sophomores and juniors in our district, current sophomores and juniors in our district are aware that they have this opportunity. And I, I think that the, the nice thing this year is we've created a lot of different leadership opportunities across the district. Our, our students advocating for equity, we've got the, we're tapping into them. We'll have two reps from them. Uh, we have the SAC group to the Student uh, Advisory Council to, and they're interested now that they've had a, a bit of a taste of, of what that leadership looks like. So I think we'll have, a, if we keep those things up, you'll have a real generous and good applicant pool moving forward. So really exciting things happening on the student leadership front. Outstanding. Any other questions for the superintendent? Director Gronwald, do you have questions? Hearing none, John, thank you. No, I don't. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I can't find my mute button for some reason. And so, now the next item on the agenda is the teaching and learning and equity department update with a special education update. Dr. Armstrong. Yeah, absolutely. Good evening. Um, first acknowledging President or Chair Perkins and uh, Vice Chair Witherspoon, Board Directors, Superintendent Boyd, and Student Advisor Taylor. Good evening. My name is Kimberly Armstrong. I serve as Deputy Superintendent. And if you all remember about two months ago, I mentioned bringing forth uh, an item or an update on special education in neighborhood schools. I think I was celebrating the presentation, hosting a school district from across the river to hear about the work and was so impressed hearing um, some of the data and, and the narrative. And so um, I'm just excited to be able to bring you that this evening under operation expectation um, number 11. And so with that, I'm gonna call up the senior director of special education to present to you this evening. Good evening. Good evening, Board of Directors, Superintendent Boyd. Okay, which goes where? <laughs> Thank you for being here and supporting. There you go. I'm just going to walk around with you all the time. All right. So, um, yeah, so tonight I'm going to talk about special education um, specifically, inclusive schools, neighborhood schools at the elementary level. I want to recognize that special education is a, it's a huge topic. Um, I like to brag that I think I have the largest school board policy and procedures out there. Um, so we're covering a huge topic area. I'm going to give an overview um, tonight. So, um, so here we go. Um, I always like to start with exactly who it is that we are talking about. So we have over three, 3,000 general education students who receive special education services. So the 3,380 number is taken back on November 1st. That is when we, we do a big count on November 1st. And so most of the data that's reported on the district is taken from this number. We are actually currently at uh, 3613 uh, students that we serve. So we have gained over uh, 200 students. That's very typical of us to do that um, throughout the year as we have students who graduate, move on. We then spend the next year identifying um, new students on our count. So that's an idea of how many students that we serve. The other pie chart that I have there gives a little of a picture of the type 
of students uh, that we serve. So we have 11 different, what we call disability categories that students qualify under. Um, and our largest category is called specific learning disability. Um, so that is largely a group of students who qualify in an area, an academic area, such as reading, writing, math, or math, and or any of those uh, three subjects. Um, and so we're talking about students who largely receive academic support. They're probably one to two years below grade level. Um, that is the largest category of students that we serve, um, followed um, by students who qualify in an area called communication disordered. So these are largely students who receive services from a speech and language pathologist for communication delays, perhaps an articulation uh, delay. Um, and that also in various ways affects their educational performance. And then another, the third kind of most qualifying area is health impairment. So these are students who have some kind of health condition, health conditions such as attention deficit disorder, largely a group of students who are also impacted um, academically. And so again, very similar to students with specific learning disabilities. So I'm just giving you kind of a little bit of sense of um, the students that we have. Some, those are considered more high incidence um, disability categories. And whereas there are also students in our district with more low incident um, disabilities, like 3% of our students qualify under intellectual disability. They have a cognitive uh, disability that affects them, or 5% qualify under emotional behavioral disability, that there's some behavioral um, disability that's affecting their progress. Um, you, I do wanna make note, you see a couple there that are listed at 0%. Um, that is not necessarily accurate. It is less than 1%. Um, that's just how this um, gets presented though. Um, so we just, it's it, less than 1% um, is a smaller number, but we definitely have uh, students in all the different um, areas. Um, in special education, there are a number of things that we are rated on that um, there are, that is, um, sorry, that data is taken on. Everything from how we do for our preschool age students from the time they enter uh, preschool services to the time that they leave, um, how students do on state assessments, whether they participate, how students, um, the percent of our students who graduate on time, receive a diploma, to after high school, um, after graduation, are they engaged? Are they seeking higher ed? Are they employed? when um, after that they graduate. So we have a whole range of information that um, we report on, that we get data on. And the one that I wanna spend a little time on is this one here. And this talks to least restrictive environment, which is one of the things that actually the work here affects much of the results that were on that previous slide. So I wanna take a little time and talk about what this means. Um, and I wanna start with, um, there's largely three categories when we talk about least restrictive environment. It's all about the amount of time a student is in general education. So, um, and we've got 80 to 100% of the time in general ed, 40 to 79, and zero to 39%. And it just talks about the time. So um, not necessarily the type of services, just the amount of time. And a number of years ago, um, it was recognized that the state of Washington was one of the lowest um, performing states in the nation around LRE, that we had the most students who were in LRE two and three. Um, and not just all our students, um, but also realized that our students of color, um, particularly our, our black students were, um, we were seeing disproportionate rates in LRE two and three than in one. 
So that started um, a lot of work around inclusive practices. Um, and that's why, that's one of the reasons why it's on the forefront here. And this idea of least restrictive environment is an essential component of any time the IEP team, so the Individualized Education Program IEP team gets together, one of the key things they have to talk about is the amount of time a student is in general education. And the idea is that they're talking about the maximum extent appropriate for a student to be in general education. And it's not until the team has talked through if there's the nature or, or the severity of the disability um, that perhaps that time away from general education is necessary. And so there's a couple things I wanna talk about here. Um, the idea is that there is a continuum of services, okay? So sometimes the least restrictive environment for a student is 20% of the time in general education. Okay, so we need to recognize um, that. I wanna make sure that the, I, we understand the idea here is not necessarily to go to 100% of our students being served in LRE 1. Okay, and that's something that is often, when people talk about full inclusion, that is what they are talking about. So that is not necessarily the objective. We recognize that students need that continuum of services and that it likely even changes over time. Um, and the reason why I do wanna make a point of saying that is because I think that has been something that has been miscommunicated, has um, been uh, misunderstood at times, and I think it is important for us um, to come back to make sure that everybody has a full understanding of what that means. Um, what is important, however, <laughs> is that we are having intentional conversations about what that appropriate LRE is. And that's where we start getting into um, con conversations about inclusion. Um, actually, I should also just kind of step back here for a second and make sure that you understand what these charts are. So the first line is the district, our district percentages. and. The idea is that your LRE is high, your LRE one is going to be going up and your LRE two and three is decreasing. Um, I also have the state uh, numbers up there. So we are outperforming the state in, um, in LRE and We've also made some improvements from 2022 to 2023, particularly in LRE two and three. You can see that um, the percent of students that we have being served in LRE three is fewer than it was the previous year. Um, so what I, again, what I wanted to come back to, it's not, about that 100% of LRE1, it is about intentional conversations about how we can provide access to general education, uh, general education curriculum, um, content, how we have high expectations, how we use our data to inform the decisions that we're making around this, and, and it is about a presumption of competence. It's about those high expectations. It's not just assuming that a student with a cognitive uh, delay would not benefit from time in general education or that there are things that can um, ben be benefited from. Um, so, um, Okay, oh, the other thing, sorry, I just have like, I don't wanna forget something. Um, the other reason why we focus on LRE two and three and looking at decreasing that is because there is definitely a history of marginal, marginalizing 
um, students with disabilities away from the general education um, curriculum and content. And which then just further perpetuates marginalizing students with disabilities um, in society. So when students with disabilities experience opportunity gaps, that's um, when we have increased risk of not achieving academic achievement. Um, so let's move on to, so I'm gonna kind of talk a bit about the why behind what we do when we, so again, the, let me just go back to the previous slide. What we're largely talking about here when you look at this data, we're talking about um, the amount of time a student is in general education um, and the amount of access that they have. Um, but there's also that other element of inclusion that's included in there. Um, that is where we're talking about sense of belonging, we're talking about expectations. Um, so overall, some of the um, objectives with the work that we're doing, and by doing and reinforcing um, inclusionary practices, we are affecting those other data that I showed there to you earlier. We are affecting uh, graduation. We are affecting post-school outcomes. We are addressing the confidence that students have as lifelong learners. Um, these are some examples of what inclusive schools do. They hold high, high expectations. We create opportunities for that access um, of instruction to learn, to be assessed in a variety of ways. Um, we're providing the academic, social, and emotional support that creates a supportive environment. And we're fostering that school culture of belonging. And there are over 80 years of research about the benefits of inclusion. We know that when we, we put these practices into place, we do have improved communication and social skills. So this is where there's an interesting balance. If you have students with communication delays and you have them all segregated together, um, that creates less modeling, less opportunities for them to improve those skills. Same thing with behavior. The more that you put students who struggle behaviorally together, uh, the less likely they are to make improvements because they don't have the modeling and the opportunities to, um, to try those skills. Um, high ex higher expectations for student learnings, higher attendance, higher engagement, higher improvement um, in academic areas. This slide is just here, because I mentioned inclusion in a lot of different ways, and we talk about it in a lot of different ways. I've used inclusion, inclusive schools, I've used inclusive practices, we have inclusive learning, we have teaching and instructional strategies, all different ways of looking at how to improve those outcomes and how to foster that sense of belonging. So, um, this is in your packet as well, and I, if you are not able to connect to the link that is there, this is um, a really nice resource, a document that talks to a lot of the myths around inclusive education. This is specifically written um, in reference to students with cognitive disabilities, but it definitely can be applied across the board. So. Things, so some of the myths, um, cost more, um, not that more than one person can um, provide specially designed instruction, um, readiness, assessment. There's a number of myths out there about what inclusive ed education is, and this is one of those documents that's a nice resource to use as um, reference. So I've been talking about inclusive schools, inclusive practices, so where does neighborhood schools and that fit in? So neighborhood schools basically is that your school assignment, as a student with a disability, your school assignment is within the neighborhood that you live. So neighborhood schools and inclusive schools 
are somewhat independent of each other. You, you can kind of do one without the other. Um, but if you are truly building um, inclusive schools, neighborhood schools is something that falls within that. Um, and as we've, so as we've moved to neighborhood schools, we are still providing a continuum of services. So we do have students in schools that, have, that are served under those various LREs. Um, and we have done so with the idea of still keeping flex, so we do what we call flexible staffing. So we have special education teachers who are serving students on their caseload um, that have all sorts of needs. But again, with that idea of the continuum um, and providing the services that that student needs. Um, outcomes is something that people are obviously, and as am I, always interested in. Um, how are we doing? And I've thrown up a couple of ways that we talk about outcomes. And what would be nice is um, in another year or so um, is to come back and talk to the data a little bit more because as, I, as I've kind of come on in to this district, I realize that this is something that could be a little bit better organized and have um, some ways that we can really talk to the outcomes that we're seeing. So one of the ways of outcomes that we're seeing in the chart above is just iReady scores. Um, so again, we have students with disabilities, students who are working below grade level. So the idea of always getting to grade level, that's definitely what we're looking to do. But really what we're often looking at is the rate of their progress. Okay, and is that progress measurable over a year? And that is some of the data that we're seeing. The two other charts here are, um, I borrowed these from um, one of our special education teachers, uh, who it's specific student data. And the reason why I put these up here, um, as well as the other chart is also, as we talk about outcomes, the way that they get to these outcomes is by doing some of the practices. Um, so some of the things that um, need to happen are data-driven decision-making um, and collaboration. So in all of these situations, we have teams who are looking at the information, um, that are looking at the data, data, even the behavioral data, and making adjust, adjustments based on that, making decisions about what the instruction looks like, um, increasing, decreasing, um, changing it up, and they're doing so as a team. So that's between general educator and the special educator, as well as any other number of people. Sometimes it's the paraeducator. We have other specialists. We have other coaches from the building that come in and collaborate on this information. Um, we have two elementary schools this year who are out of improvement. Uh, they were in an area of improvement because of their scores for students with disabilities. They have since um, worked their way out of areas of improvement in this specific area, again, using a lot of the principles that we're talking about and the strategies and the practices. More important, well, I don't know, more important, just as important, um, there's data that we can't quite quantify that way, but there's data that we get through student voice and student experiences and parent voice. So I have some pictures thrown up here, and I, I um, in all of these situations, there are students here who at some point were either sent to um, another school for services or they had an LRE um, that was close to 0% of the time in general ed. And through the use of what I've been talking about, practices, collaboration, looking at the data, they have 
increase their time in general education. So there's kind of been the snowball effect that happens as you um, have more time in general education, are able to access that more, um, it starts snowballing. So there's pictures here, students who up until a certain time were not out at recess. Um, students who were not having lunch with their peers um, and now are. Um, and, and they have friend groups. Um, some of these students are able to communicate through uh, communication devices. And um, the story behind one of these uh, pictures up here is that um, an adult um, was checking in on a kid and was asking some questions. Um, and another, a peer, uh, recognized that the kid did not have his communication device next to him, went to go get it and bring it, and made a point of saying, hey, this is how we communicate with so-and-so. So again, those, those peer interactions are starting to happen. The sense of belonging is there. Um, those are very important in all this work because those are the things that improve student outcomes. So that is a lot of our work. Um, with that being said, um, we know we have work to improve on. And the very first thing I have listed up here as a focus area is strengthening and communicating our vision and priorities. Um, I would say that has been the number one feedback that I have gotten from listening, interviewing, survey information from staff, from families, is um, being clear about what our priorities are, being clear about what inclusive practices are, um, being clear about the continuum of services. Um, those are things that are very important to district, uh, important to the district, to uh, families, to our staff, and um, we have started that work um, of improving our communication, as well as guidance around what we do. Because as I mentioned before, there has been some miscommunication, there has been some misunderstanding, and so it's important that we clarify that. Alignment of the practices across the district. So what you're going to find is a number of schools who are doing, like they are solid in this work. Um, they are doing really well. And then we have some other schools who have parts of it. So it's recognizing where are those places that are struggling, where are their barriers to that, and wrapping around those sco um, schools and, um, and areas and um, working on that. Uh, just continued focus on data-informed decision-making, professional development, collaboration. Those are all key pieces to making um, this work successful. Um, I've put up here family engagement. So this is one of those uh, stay tuned uh, things. And I would love to come back next year and talk about this a little bit more. So when we're talking about inclusion, when we're talking about these efforts and creating sense of belonging and looking at uh, post-secondary, um, that is not work that the district that uh, the schools, that the teams can do themselves. That takes a, a collaboration with our families and with our community. So I've been part of a lot of listening type sessions and it's really time to start with some actions. And so we are in the process um, of creating a family engagement event um, this fall. So I have a small uh, but mighty team uh, working on planning that and um, we're really looking forward to that. Um, and then Final, final things, uh, what I want to leave you with, I love this picture. This is um, one of our principals uh, uses this a lot from, again, a student who um, had spent quite a bit of time in a special education class um, for most of her time. And the team um, worked, were looking for 
opportunity after opportunity for the student to have access to general ed and they started to find them. She started to grow and she's almost, um, she's probably in that LRE one, 80 to 100% in the general ed class. And she wrote this note. Um, I believe she was out sick for a while and her big thing um, was that she missed her class and that she feels sad. That she had gone from having a very segregated setting, um, not being part of the class, to having this sense of belonging um, with her class, with her peers, with her school. So, um, like I said, I covered a very huge topic <laughs> and a very small amount of time. So um, any questions or thoughts? I have a couple questions. <clears throat> yes. On the outcomes, Yeah. you had elopement. Oh, yes. What is elopement? Mm -hmm. Elopement is when you, you leave your designated area. I, I think that's the best way to say. So you're in a classroom. And let's say you get stressed, you get overwhelmed, and you leave the classroom. Um, perhaps you just leave um, to go to another spot, and, or you actually leave the school building. That is what elopement means. This is why our principals and teachers wear tennis shoes. Yes. <laughs> What is refusal? So refusal, um, you know what, and actually as you ask these questions, um, these are things um, that are very well defined in a behavior plan so that every staff member knows what it is and what the response is when the student engages in that behavior. So as I described to you, elopement, that is one example. That could look a little bit different. Refusal could be refusal to do a task, and the student just sits there refusing to do it. <laughs> that is one example of refusal. Not, I mean, basically, the, the definition is not following with uh, the task, the command. Okay. What, um, what year was neighborhood schools or inclusive schools implemented in Evergreen? So um, there's at different times, um, so at the secondary level, we go quite a bit far back, and sorry that I don't have that date in front of me. Um, the, um, I believe the elementary kind of went um, in stages. So there were some schools that uh, went early, like some of our uh, new schools were built. It was an opportunity to move to that model. Um, they went, and then I believe, um, so is this the third year or? Either the right. second or third year that all our elementary schools have gone to this model. Yes. So that would be 2019, 2020. Yeah. So, so 21, 22. Okay. How's that sound? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was just looking at um, OSPI and uh, the uh, students with disabilities and. 2019, it was 17.4 percent of the students meeting okay. mm -hmm. meeting English ELA standards, and 22, 23, it was 12.8 uh, percent. Okay. So it dropped down about 25 percent. Um, math similar it was 12.9 percent, and granted, these numbers are not great, but um, it's it is what it is. But um, in 22, 23, dropped down to 9.7%. So both of them dropped about 25% during that time period. So. And is that in reference to the 19, 20 school year? Um, I believe. So when you read 19, that usually is in reference 19, to the 20, 19, I don't think 20 they school had year. Any data for OSPI for COVID. So it was 20. And, and that's 19, what 19. I wanted to make note of. Yeah. yeah. yeah during the COVID years. That. Get that data and update, yes. uh, update at, a, at a later time, too. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I was curious, too. I know a, a little over a month ago I had asked about um, missing IEP mm -hmm. um, hours, uh, minutes. Um, just uh, didn't know if there was any feedback on that. You know, the last five, ten years, have those hours gone up or? So, um So when we talk about 
missed minutes. Um, that has been something that has been um, more in the forefront over the last couple years. Um, as we have difficulty filling positions. Exactly. We have difficulty filling para positions. Um, another one has been um, SLPs, um, our speech language pathologists. There are times where we have not been able to provide this, the services. And we talk with those families and um, come up with a plan for making them up. Yeah, and I don't know if it's possible, possibly the parents maybe decide if they want the mm -hmm. neighborhood school model or if they want the previous uh, option. Yeah. I don't, it, one parent tonight mentioned it was positive and mm -hmm. you know, there's been several uh, comments in the last year uh, in the negative from parents and teachers. So it's, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but with mm -hmm. the paraeducator shortage we have, it makes it difficult to sustain this program throughout, you know, throughout all the schools. So. Yeah, I appreciate the question. I think one of the um, number one takeaways that I, I would ask for you all to hold on to is that um, it's a belief statement. So if we believe that our schools belong to our community, our neighborhoods, then we must believe that our students should have access to their neighborhood schools with their peers. But two things can be true. Um, as mm -hmm. Our senior director has said there is a lot of work that um, we need to do. Um, there are some safety concerns. Our teachers, some of our teachers, um, are not feeling supported, are not feeling like they're receiving the training to be successful in an inclusive model. And so there is a plan um, to address those. And so I, I hope that we can be before you a few more times over the next several months as we get um, clear and as mm -hmm. Ellen mentioned, um, really focused in our communication. So, so we can appreciate um, and even have a strong belief system in what neighborhood schools are and can be, and also recognize that there are lots of things that we need to correct. Um, and I, the plan is to do that and do that um, as soon as possible. We need all of our spaces to be a safe place to learn. And some of the incidents and things that we're hearing about is not okay. And we are not um, just sitting by and, and watching or listening. Um, there is a, is a plan to, uh, to address that. And um, so that's, that's what I would want you to, to hold on to. And then I'd, I'd like to chime in just a little bit. One thing that we cannot imagine, we cannot imagine, um, sending our students to programs across the district as before, um, sending them and segregating them in the way that they were segregated in the past. What we can imagine is some flexibility in the continuum of services that we have within a school to support staff and teachers and principals to do it in a way that makes sense for the student populations they serve. So we had what I thought was a very productive meeting with um, our EEA president, Christy Peak, and a couple of teachers to talk about that very thing. And I appreciate her leadership, Christy's leadership, in bringing us together. We have a long way to go to be able to talk through some things. There's still a lot of concerns with our EEA. There's still a lot of things that we have to work on, and we know that we haven't done everything exactly perfectly. And, and I appreciate Ellen coming forward and, and you know saying that, but also we need to move forward for our students in the way that um, is best for all of our students. So there's much work to do. Uh, in a neighborhood schools model it, within inclusive practice that we think um, working with our partners can make it better across the district. My, my question would be like, because we have 3,300 students that are being served, and one thing I want to say is that I do believe that our students have a right to attend their neighborhood school. Um, with story we heard earlier, I think that it does wonders for kids for be able to go to the school that's next door to their house and then be with kids that are there in their peer group. Um, but the 3,300 students that we're serving, and I know that we have a lot of behavior issues, and I know a lot of behavior issues have happened post-COVID. And um, you know, just like the other testimony we got this evening when we uh, were presented the book, I don't know, I mean, are all of those cases, are those all of the students that are being served in this program, or are they other students that aren't being served? I mean, we, I don't even know that we have the data on that. Is what I guess I'm, is my question. 
Um, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so what I would say is um, it, it, there's no question that we have a number of students that are more that are coming to us who are dysregulated. Um, we have kids coming to us in fourth grade who have not been to school at all. Um, we have kids coming from trauma. We have, um, it, it, and they're coming to school like that. And I don't have the data on it, but I don't think anybody in education would argue with me that says that it is a lot more than we've ever experienced before. Um, and what I will say to that is that most of those students that we're talking about um, don't have a disability. They haven't been identified for special education. So it's, it's not just, uh, this is not, because of the neighborhood schools model. We have um, a community problem, a school problem of needing to develop systems that address the students who are coming to us. Um, we have more students than ever who are, I'm gonna use the word neurodiverse, um, uh, and, and we as a system need to, figure out um, how we can provide the supports that they and their families need. Thank you, lots of work to, do, to be done. I know from uh, conversations with superintendents across the state, it's not unique to our uh, setting. There's lots of dysregulation in our communities um, and uh, lots of uh, complex uh, needs of our students that we have to attend to. So thank you very much. To um, two more questions. Actually, you may have answered one of them. Uh, on the counts uh, that you gave us at the beginning of the presentation, were those uh, full-time equivalent counts or were those head counts? Of students? Yeah. Uh, head count. And I should also mention that is age three to age 21. That's the federal definition and it's head count. Yes. And so we would expect to see, you know, because one of my kids was on an IEP with a 15 minute window for his anxieties. And uh, that would be like a point zero something FTE, wouldn't it? Oh, so you're trying to quantify the amount of service time for... Well, what I'm asking is whether the FTE number reported for accounting pur purposes is smaller than the head count. We don't do an FTE count for students. It is one, one student, if you're on an IEP, that's one student. Okay. Do I understand your question? Well, uh, yeah, I'm thinking of the state reports, and maybe this dovetails more with the finance department than it would with yours, but uh, FTE is the number in the formula. And I wondered how, if that was, uh, you, you don't differentiate that way providing the services, but whether or not we're funded that way is kind of my question. Yeah, yeah, I just wonder not. if that's a question that we can answer and um, get to board. Get to the board. Of course, yeah. of course. <laughs> um, and then the other, the other side of that is the funding formula question that I have because there is, uh, there's a multiplier in the funding for the special education, I think, general fund allocation. And uh, it's higher for funding IEPs and student services for um, LRE1 than it is for LRE2 and 3. And... Uh, uh, so I'm wondering about that and uh, what kinds of uh, kinds of impacts that has on us. Um, I think one of the things you said there was that it isn't costlier to bring those services to the neighborhood school, but uh, is it costlier to provide services to students who need LR1 and or LR2 and 3? Oh boy, okay. So a lot to unpack with that. So yeah. I'm not going to be able to talk to all of that. Um, I'm just going to leave you um, as you all know, probably already, that special education is largely unfunded. Um, so uh, in order to do what we are obligated to do, um, it costs considerably more than what we are funded at. Thank you. How about that? It's <laughs> a good answer. All, all advocacy is welcomed and supported. Thank you. That was the next question. Appreciate it. Thank you.
Hey, a couple of technical details here, or problems. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and take a five minute recess. Well, can I just add one thing, just because John had mentioned um, what he did about um, the inclusive school model. I know um, the Columbian had an article and Superintendent Phelps. Oh, well, Director Bogenager isn't in the room at the moment. Um, could we hold this until after the recess, please? Sure. All right. All right, five minutes. from you.
what's that? Off. Doesn't have to be turned off. It's uh, it's a Faraday cage, so it just uh, <laughs> it blocks all the radio signals while it's in the bag. Okay, we'll come back to order. Thank you for uh, your patience. The next item on the agenda is a matter for board action uh connected with the interim superintendent search process and uh some other news since our workshop last week um i got the slides here mm. Uh, Diana, can you help me? I'm used to Excel and I was using sheets. Uh, the document, uh, there's some technical problems with the document inside our uh, diligent community thing. Um, but it's not a very long slideshow, and I'll make sure that copies get to everybody as quickly as possible. It's already been archived for the public record. Um, our task today is to uh, examine what we've found so far, uh, and um, I'm going to present you with some options uh, for either retaining a, uh, a search firm for an interim search process, a very accelerated one compared to a full national search, um, or uh, having staff uh, here at APS uh, help us with the uh, logistics and elements of uh, a self-guided search process without a consultant. Um, in the process of uh, thinking about uh, how to bring this forward, I, uh, I, we opened up the uh, superintendent search at evergreenps.org uh, email address, which received a couple hundred um, responses with uh, lots of lots of value statements in them uh, lots of suggestions for how uh, the process should uh, should proceed uh, and uh, we also had from two years ago um, the leadership quality values surveys that uh, dr. Cam uh, dr. Tammy Campbell um, of uh, scholar first had led while we were uh, considering a, um, the permanent superintendent position uh, at that time. So all of that data together with uh, the emails that we got and a consultation with the Evergreen Community Advisory Team uh, produced this set of values uh, that I was able to summarize with the uh, help of my computer, uh, is that a good leader has these characteristics, putting students first, innovation, keeping things steady, respectful inclusion, cultural understanding, equal opportunities, high ethical standards, responsible behavior. Uh, and the order that this is placed in uh, is, was kind of a scoring that I did to put the uh, values that affect students the most towards the top of the list. And uh, all of that is combined with our board results and operational expectations policies, which um, we're able to use as an expression of the values the board has as a full board. Uh, so this is what uh, the work of engagement with some stakeholders in the short amount of time that we've had uh, produced as a set of ideas uh, for leadership qualities so far. We, um, we've, we saw, uh, well, I'll just come to this. 
Okay. Um, what's happened is that uh, Executive, uh, well, our CFO, uh, Jennifer Jacobson, uh, sat down with us and uh, put out a request for quotations to uh, five firms, uh, and we received a response from two firms. Uh, the first of which on this slide is the, uh, the firm Human Capital Enterprises. They're currently doing the Portland Public Schools search, and uh, uh, they supplied us with a draft interim superintendent search timeline and quoted a fee of $12,900 with the statement, we will match a lower pricing bid subject to scope of work and agreement. Um, so for 12-9, uh, they'd propose a timeline like this which would appoint an interim superintendent uh, given everything going well in that period of time by the 1st of July. Um, the principal recruiter at Human Capital Enterprises is Hank Harris, uh, and the, presenta or the uh, document that they sent us pointed out that he's a former teacher at Evergreen Public Schools. He taught in the, uh, uh, in the uh, alternative learning school before it was named Legacy. So he actually goes back with us quite a number of years. Um, and they come pretty well recommended from many people. Um, so that's our first one. If you give yourself a chance to just have a look at the um, draft superintendent search timeline. I imagine that if they were to match a lower price, and there's an another one with a lower price coming, that uh, some of these items would have to come off the list, which would shorten the time frame that we need for um, interviewing uh, candidates who step up. So let me know when you're ready for the next slide. Good. Okay. Rain Associates is a national search firm who uh, put together a full superintendent search proposal for us uh, with uh, a pretty high price tag and uh, then they came back with a second approach uh, for just the interim superintendent and quoted a fee of $5,000, which if they're selected in the full RFP for the, uh, the, long, su the long search is what I'll call it, um, they would credit that $5,000 back against the fee that they uh, um, proposed for a full search. And they also suggested, well, what you see on the right there with their timeline is uh, their timeline for a full search uh, to begin uh, next week and end on the, um, after the finalist candidates were interviewed on the 22nd of July, uh, but there are still items there that uh, go with a full search that might not go with an interim search. So I also imagine that this timeline at $5,000 would be shorter with some elements removed, uh, but we would still be able to get there um, on time for a uh, Superintendent Boyd's departure. So that's the two search firms that came up. Um, without a search firm, uh, the work would fall to uh, ASC staff to arrange and structure interviews in collaboration with the board. And John, I wonder if uh, you'd be willing to talk a little bit about um, our discussions over the phone and, and what that would look like if we had the district do it and uh, the burden of work. Yeah, uh, Director Perkins and I talked about uh, the possibility of doing an, um, um, a process inside of ASC here to be able to do that, and uh, uh, which doesn't cost any money and allows the uh, probably a little bit of a quicker timeline uh, to be able to get to a an appointment um, uh, before I depart. But we could do something similar to what we do for principals and pull together um, a cross-section of our community, some community members, students, uh, teachers, uh, leaders, and have maybe a student panel, maybe have an interview process, and the board could interview separately and do them on a rotating basis for a day and bring in three to five candidates and allow for uh, the board to then um, uh, get feedback forms from the student panel and feedback forms from the interview process from the larger, and then engage in a in their own, um, in your own interview process with them, uh, which can be done in executive session. So, I mean, that's just one example of what we could do. There's a, a million uh, variations of what the board wants, but uh, the staff is prepared to help if that's what you should decide. 
Thank you. Um, so that, that is essentially the three options. Uh, the other firms uh, who replied to us either submitted full superintendent search uh, proposals or asked to participate in the full RFP uh, when we release that later on. So what I see is option A would be human capital, um, charging us $5,000 uh, with an adjusted scope of work as a price match to Rain Associates. Uh, Rain Associates is also offering $5,000, uh, which would be credited back if they're selected in the full RFP. And uh, then option C would be uh, to use a similar process to um, Deputy Superintendent Armstrong's uh, selection, right, over the course of one day, after which uh, we would interview and then discuss qualifications in executive session uh, and make an appointment. I'm sorry, Rob, what did you just say about? Uh, sorry, I am. <laughs> I keep looking at my own screen. Uh, it, it's which part? Option A, option B, option C? C. Option C would be a, um, a process uh, roughly similar to what uh, Dr. Armstrong experienced in those other candidates in their selection, uh, where, as John said, um, we'd have um, selected people from the community, from the union leaderships, uh, from teaching staff, uh, and uh, they would conduct, and students, and they would conduct interviews uh, using a specific set of questions, uh, which would then be handed to us uh, for our evaluation and our discussions. But after those panels uh, interviewed the candidates, we would also interview the candidates in executive session using our own questions. And, uh, did that answer it? Yes. Okay. So those are the three. And what I'd like to do is open this up for questions or um, any, any other details that uh, you might like to surface before we uh, get to a motion? I have some thoughts. Um, well, my, I, I'll just start from the beginning. So option A, um, I, the 5,000 price tag seems better than the 12,000. However, I would be curious to see what of that list would be eliminated from the search because they feel very comparable. The two the two firms feel comparable in mm -hmm. what they would be doing. The one has the twelve thousand. The other one has the five thousand. With the caveat that we choose them for the full. And I don't know that we're prepared to pick a, a company for the full search. So that would be my thing on option B. Mm -hmm. I don't think that um, we have to choose them for the full search. It's just it's oh, they gives a credit back. Yeah. I see. So I, I see. Okay. It it uh, it creates savings off of their original proposal, which is we choose uh, okay. them. That that is, when the sense. RFP opens, I imagine that that's the proposal that they'd be sending us. Um, there are some things in um, both of the proposals that I think we could probably, you know, because it is such a trite turnaround mm -hmm. that they we probably could um, eliminate. So, looking at this timeline. Uh, what do you think those well, things would be? Well, I, I'm, I'm just wondering about um, I, I just don't know what, what he would what they would eliminate, but mm -hmm. um, the online survey window maybe the um, I don't know if the other company had that in there. It's hard to tell with them without them being side by side, but yeah. Um, um, they both have online surveys uh, in their five-stage process. Each of them has a five-stage process. Um, well, and so those are elements that exist that we've used before and recently that um, I imagine could come off of there. Did uh, Human Capital give us a quote for the full search, too? No, they only quoted for... They only did the intro. Yeah. They did as they were yeah, instructed. Yeah, they, they did as we asked. <laughs> uh, and the others... Um, either bowed out or then Ray and Associates also did as we asked. Okay. Well, before we look at an outside firm, is there a way to understand whether we have a qualified and person within Evergreen that would want to apply for the position? We would have to, I think, open the position and uh, then receive the applications. Which I'm 
miss that detail, but I think we should open the position beginning tomorrow and have the two-week window to the end of May uh, to get applicants to come in. Do that before we bring on the search firm, if we chose that route? Well, if we choose a search firm, then we'll, we'll rely on them and their coordination. But if we're doing it uh, just inside the district, uh, we'd need to open it and then also advertise it with uh, WASA, WASDA, and a couple of other networks. Have we spoken to our internal staff and how they feel about going with option C and having them do it? Have we like gauged some like their feelings on whether or not that that's in the scope of their like timeline for next year and all the other things that we've been planning? Talking about the workload? Yes. Okay. Um, yes, there has. John, would you like to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, great question. We did talk to our staff and um, based on what uh, Director Perkins suggested that we, we do there, we our staff has the bandwidth and the capacity to do that. Great. Director Gronwald, do you have any questions? Um, I think the only question I had was uh, answered by Sullivan, or asked by Sullivan, so thank you. Okay. So to proceed tonight, we're either awarding a contract or we're not, but I'll need a motion from someone. Or we can continue talking about, you know, like, what's your favorite? So that I can hear what the consensus is going towards and then get the motion. Well, I've said kind of all along that I did not want to pay a search firm for an interim if we could do it through WASA, WASDA, ESD, if we could help, they could help us find candidates through that group. I know that ESDs help conduct searches before in the past too and provide those services. Um, I, because it's such a tight time frame, and I want John to be able to transition with whoever is selected and, and e help ease that into the next school year. Um, I don't know. It's very difficult because it's hard to know what human capital will do at a lower price. Um, Right, and it'd be subject to this. What was, what was the price of Ray and Associates for the full scope? Do you remember? The, the full search was, do you have that document? Uh, the full search for Ray and Associates was the highest uh, quoted fee. Is that the 36? 36? 36.9, yeah, 36,900. Um, which if we were to choose option B and then award them the contract would be 33, 31,900. I, I mean, I, I feel like I would rather put all of our eggs in a permanent superintendent search and start that process and finding that company and then finding qualified candidates that are willing to come in for the year to help us. Um, my one concern is if we try to do it ourselves that I don't know what the candidate pool will be like. And then, we're, then we, their time clock is ticking very quickly. Mm -hmm. That's the fear that I have. And that's one of the reasons why I actually prefer the uh, search firm, because I feel like they might help us um, get to a wider um, range of people, a wider range of candidates. Um, I know that our staff has the bandwidth and can do this, um, but I like the idea that because we haven't done it before, and the last time we've chosen interim superintendents, we've done it internally, I'd like this time to do something different. I'm not opposed to that. I I guess then if the, if we were going to go with that option, my favorite would probably be option A and see what they can do to match that price of the uh, national search firm and do the person who's local okay. and maybe cut out some of the other things that and then just get us to the point where they find candidates, do the interviews and help facilitate the process. Well, option B, they do include the community survey. Oh. Both of them uh, proposed a community survey element, um, but we don't know without uh, negotiating the scope of work with both of them what, uh, whether or not that would be included in their price. Um, to that end uh, was why I um, went through and did an analysis of the previous uh, the previous community surveys that we've done with respect to leadership values, which would be the context and scope of the uh, surveys that the search firms would produce. So the five um, 
If you go back to Ray and Associates, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that there. Is that interim or is that superintendent? That's for the interim search. Okay, so They're they do have, search they definitely do have community. You mentioned they have community. They both did. Okay. Uh, they both have it in but there. the other one might drop it if a, a caveat there as you're looking at Ray and Associates is that this is the only timetable they gave us with a July time frame. But uh, what you're looking at is a full superintendent search timetable. Um, including uh, meetings with constituent and stakeholder representatives, including um, finalizing a superintendent profile, the publication of pamphlets, the, um, uh, it's really the full package there on that list. Um, so as with uh, human capital, Ray and Associates would abbreviate this list. And I, I do like the time frame better on um, human capital. Mm -hmm. Than the Ray and Associates, I like the time frame better. I mean, it's tight, but I I just like that time frame better if it can be done by mm -hmm. July first, when we nice. when we roll over the new the new calendar year or school calendar year. Director Garnwell, I'm. Uh, what was the name of the first one? I'm sorry. Uh, human Capital Enterprises. Okay, thank you. The sh I don't have the sheet in front of me. Um, I I like the idea of going with the search firm for our interim. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and if we can get them to drop that price down to a more palatable cost, um, I think I would be... Uh, in, in favor of option A as well. All right. I was going to suggest that maybe we don't even have to drop all the way to the 5,000 to match Ray and Associates, but see what they can do under the 12,000 price tag to get us more in line with Ray and Associates and keep the scope of what they have on the board. I agree. I would also like to know if they are willing to drop it that low. I know they said they would, but um, do they realize what that meant? or what that means and are they willing to drop it lower and like director booker said you know down to the five thousand isn't a necessity but a more palatable cost um low much lower than the twelve thousand nine hundred yeah i, I could right, vote for either as long as we do have a community survey in there My preference is, uh, my, my preference actually sits, my recommendation would be um, if we hire a firm that it be human capital. Um, I'm very confident in our staff to set up a structure for us that will be uh, equitable, fair, and uh, well enough published. Uh, but I too am a little concerned about the workload. I think if we use a firm that uh, the kind of participation that the public uh, can expect will be more institutional and more survey-based than uh, if we were to select some um, committed individuals to participate in actual interviews. Um, so, you know, based kind of on what I'm hearing here, uh, it sounds like option A, uh, with permission to go over the 5,000 if how about we make a motion and then maybe that'll give us scope of an idea of what or how okay so i guess i'll make the motion so i move that we select option a human capital um their initial proposal was twelve thousand dollars for the full scope of the interim superintendent with the um permission for the board chair and vice chair to negotiate a price that goes down depending on how much is removed out of the scope with preference to keep the online survey. Okay. But spending no more than 12000 I'll second that. <laughs> oh, well, okay. So it's been moved and seconded. Directors uh, Wilkenega and Gronwald. Uh, to award a contract to human capital uh, 
in an amount not to exceed $12,000 uh, for an abbreviated superintendent search, um, which includes at least an online survey. Correct. Uh, is there any other discussion at this point? Having been moved and seconded, that's the proposal. Option A, up to 12000 Hearing no further discussion, um, we'll take a vote. Um, all in favor of option A, as moved by Director Bocanegra? Aye. 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 Uh, then the motion carries uh, with a unanimous vote. Uh, we'll move from here to open up conversations with uh, human capital and uh, see, if they'll, see what they'll match with the 5,000 and then put some things back based on the authority that we've been given. Uh, and we'll do that right away. Now, um, one more slide, actually. <laughs> it's all good. Um, this is sort of an amalgam of the full superintendent search from the proposals uh, suggested by all of the search firms who've uh, submitted something, um, is that we would uh, issue the formal RFP as soon as possible with a submission window for the full search of an August 1st closure. That would give us the August 13th uh, meeting to workshop uh, the different options, and then we would make a selection on August 27th. All of the search firms propose a stakeholder feedback process uh, and uh, interviews with the board uh, and, and other senior leadership uh, to gather uh, requirements that the search firm would use when they open the position. Uh, the September-October time frame. Then through November and December, uh, they propose that the position is open and the search firm conducts initial interviews with candidates uh, before they present to the board the um, list of candidates that they recommend for consideration. And uh, we would then select semi-finalists uh, and do interviews uh, and then select finalists for uh, a public part of the process uh, where there might be uh, things like town hall meetings or uh, Q&A sessions. Uh, and and uh, they'd be able to meet other community leaders, and it can be pretty comprehensive. Uh, that would also be time for the community and other stakeholders to supply input. Uh, and then in late February, uh, we could as early as late February be selecting a permanent superintendent with a start date to be determined by the board and the selected candidate in, in I, I think, in collaboration as well with the interim superintendent, because we get an interim, we're going to have to write a contract. Um, and there could be some overlap between the interim superintendent's contract and the start date, depending on what we decide to do at that point. Um, so that's the time frame that the firms are suggesting, uh, but as we get into this discussion uh, in August, uh, we can decide to go faster or slower depending on who we retain and uh, uh, the instructions that we give to them. I feel that that looks like a pretty solid time frame. Uh, starting in August, I think, is smart. And getting the firm in place and then letting them direct the process. Yeah. And uh, that was the last slide. Thanks, Diana. So uh, can I just uh, say a couple things? Mm -hmm. Just thinking about this and our transition. Um, Thank you for the timeline. I think that's actually really helpful because I've been thinking a lot about what we have going on in our, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do. And this last next month and a half will be really busy. We just saw that timeline and how tight it is. Um, but I think it's really important that we, as a board, kind of think about what our priorities are as we move into this next year. Um, you know, I want to say tonight we approved the consent agenda, superintendent's consent agenda that had the classified report that has John's retirement on it. Mm -hmm. And I want to acknowledge that. Um, I know that we still have time, just like you said earlier, we had time to celebrate Sullivan later. We'll have time to celebrate you later as well. Um, but I do want to recognize the work that you've done in the last three years to get us um, to this point. It, you came in at a very, very difficult time. And you led us through some very challenging moments. And I'm not sure that we would be in the place that we are today had you not come in with your leadership, John. And so I wanted to thank you publicly for that. Thank you and our team of really dedicated individuals who go above and beyond every day to ensure that the district is running. Um, 
but I do think it's important for us as we move through this transition, and I'm thankful that you're here with us, John, to help us with that in the next month and a half, and then maybe even further with some consulting, as you mentioned that you would be willing to help us. Happy to volunteer my time to do any transition work necessary. Um, I think it's really important for us to sit down as a group and think about what our priorities are going in the next school year. I mean, I know that I know that we all have a um, commitment to finding a real, you know, the next superintendent. And we also have work that we want to do through our strategic plan. And, you know, we have an obligation to make sure that our kids are getting the best education possible. And that's really what I want to focus our attention on. And I think that it would be smart for us to do more of the um, timelines and put that out formally to our community. And so they know exactly what we're working on, what our priorities are. And that's something that I've been kind of thinking about and would like for us to consider. What form do you think that should take? I, I mean, that's up for discussion, or I, I don't know if it's just, you know, through, I mean, we can put it wherever we would want to, our website, or we have a whole page on our website dedicated to the board communication. Um, but just to make sure that people understand what our timelines are and what our priorities are as we move through these processes. And to that end, I think that we might want to consider having a workshop where we sort of sit down and sort of crystallize what the next year is going to look like and what we need to get accomplished. Okay, so what I'm hearing then is that uh, uh, we should schedule a workshop as soon as possible to have that discussion. Um, probably the next board meeting. Uh, and uh, cement our values, I guess, and then produce a document um, and maybe even a letter to uh, all, all of our stakeholders, uh, the whole full community describing this. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, and I think that working with the search firm, it, you know, they had one of the first things was they're going to do interviews with the board and one-on-one -on -one interviews with the board, and they're going to find out what we um, want in a superintendent. And I think that it's important for us to have some goals because asking an interim superintendent to come in here and do everything wouldn't be fair. So we need to really prioritize what's important to us and how we move forward so we can accomplish what we need to in that year's time. Yeah. Well, let's make sure that we get it on the agenda for a meeting very soon. And uh, yeah, that's good advice. We'll take that. Uh, we're into board comments, by the way. Uh, <laughs> are there any other comments from board members? Well, we, um, the school closure, um, we're getting data back now, so maybe we need to put that on the agenda in the near future. Aren't we still waiting for demographic data as well? Can you comment on that? I'm gonna, so we have a... I'm going to repeat it so that people in the audience can hear and, and online. We have a rough draft, and we should have something um, less rough in a couple of weeks at the next board meeting, you think? Okay. I'm, I'm seeing heads nod. We haven't had a chance to follow up on that, so we would have that available. Thank you. Any other comments tonight? I want to thank everybody for commenting tonight. So, thank you. I have something that I'd like to share with the board. And I, um, this is a Junior Ranger badge from uh, the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site. Uh, they were, I'm not a Junior Ranger. Um, I'm not a Ranger of any kind. Uh, but these, uh, these little badges, little pins, uh, were given to every child who participated in last Friday's culture parade. Um, this year, the uh, participants in the culture parade that I went to were Evergreen students exclusively. Um, Deputy Superintendent Armstrong and I were uh, leading the parade with uh, Mayor uh, Ann McInerney Ogle. And am I forgetting a name? Oh, and Tracy uh, 
and she's the leader at, at the National Historic Site. Her first name's Tracy. Uh, <clears throat> and we walked together and, and led the students, who were very excited to be in the parade, uh, and uh, went into the uh, uh, went into the fort, and everybody sat down together. Uh, at which point, the children all uh, gave the huzzah shout that was common in the uh, 19th century uh, when people together express their enthusiasm for something. Um, I'm just going to hold this up to the mic. You want me to play it again? It's fine. <laughs> Getting to hear that and march with the kids, uh, I, I, I've taken every opportunity I possibly could because it's one of the most um, restorative uh, events for the kids who have studied culture in their third grade classes and have brought um, these placards with their reports of their culture, uh, the culture they studied, n not necessarily their own, uh, but most of them choose their own heritage uh, to put on the, on the placards, and then they display that for all the parade goers to see. Now, we only had Evergreen, um, but that was because Vancouver's kids were scheduled for yesterday. So they also got a culture parade, and there's room now for greater participation from all the classes. And just a shout out to Ryan Theodore Richies, who helps to coordinate that from the district side, our safety and security team, and all of our bus drivers and teachers that do all the build up to that. It's uh, quite a beautiful thing that's done in Evergreen Public Schools and Vancouver. We also had uh, the, I think it was the Pacific Middle School Vikings, uh, the marching band it was one of our middle schools. I think it was Pacific this year. Uh, you, I got it. Thanks, Craig. <laughs> Thank you for your support. Uh, and it just these year-end events just make it all worthwhile to be able to see the kids in uh, all their enthusiasm uh, and celebrate with them. And now I have a junior ranger pin that I don't deserve, which will probably pass on to some kids uh, later on. Um, but you know, anyone's welcome to come up and look at it. I'll just put it on the table if you want to see it, because it's, it's a little wooden uh, pin. It actually looks like it was laser cut or something, and that's, that's kind of time consuming. So uh, thank you to the Fort Vancouver National Historic Site for preserving, and the city of Vancouver for preserving this event for students and opening it up to so many more. Oh, well, I was just going to say, I know um, Camille in her board comment had mentioned um, wanting to meet with the board, and I'm willing. And if any other board members want to join, that'd be fine. So thanks. We'll be in a discussion with that um, in the coming days. Uh, so with I also wanted to um, <clears throat> talk about Ms. McGarry, who brought to us the books and talked about cell phone bans and that concept. And that's something we probably should circle around to and have a conversation about as a board and a workshop at some point. I second that, even though that's not a motion. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, you agree. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, I, I will say that um, our schools are really working hard to try to manage that in their own context. So I think it's worthy of a conversation and maybe bringing some school leaders in to talk about their efforts and their challenges and what support they need and could lead to, um, it could lead to the right decision. And uh, we were having a conversation with um, our board rep about it, student board rep, and uh, she gave us some interesting feedback on what she thought was possible and what she thinks is not possible. Um, and you can imagine what that is. Um, and so looping students in and hearing some more student voice on that would be really interesting. Um, I would like to say thank you for bringing this up. Um, I know like as a teenager, I'm always on my phone. And um, I think that us as students, we can all kind of recognize that there's an issue and we don't really know the answer or what feels comfortable, especially in something that is an addiction really at the root of it. And um, mentioning mental health, I think that lots of our, a big, big chunk of our student body is struggling with their mental health, um, especially right this week with AP testing. Um, I can just see it in the school, like just walking through the halls, it just feels like 10 levels lower in terms of just how everyone's doing emotionally. So I really um, am thankful that that's being brought up 
And um, I look forward to having more conversations about students' mental health and also how it relates to social media and internet usage. Can I end on something? I know it's getting late, but I wanted to end on a, I, this is my favorite time of year because we're entering the um, celebration season. And so we started last Thursday evening with the celebration of our first inaugural dual immersion classroom. So uh, it was really kind of um, special for me because when I first became a school board member, the one of the first things I did, I visited the dual immersion classroom and those kids were kindergartners that year and they're graduating, which is really fun. <laughs> you were a kindergarten too when I started this work, so that's fun too. But that was one of the first things I did was visit that classroom and then I got to see them celebrate and um, receive their accolades for all the, the years that they now are um, bilingual and it was quite a nice celebration that they did for that community. I was there as well. It was wonderful uh, to see how they uh, acknowledged their teachers and their parents. It's like everybody got rose and they gave it to uh, the person who had the most influence over their decisions and, and their education and I think all the roses went to a parent and uh, listening to a student stand up and speak Spanish in her native language and speak well of her parents who were in the room. I can't understand Spanish well enough. I imagine you could, could have. <laughs> uh, but you could see the feeling and, and the devotion that came through even without um, you know full command of uh, um, a second language. I picked the wrong second language to learn uh, for that evening. Uh, and yeah, we're looking forward to graduations. And uh, we move on from there. I didn't mean to steal your thunder, but I was there too. And <laughs> it's that rose ceremony just really struck me as beautiful, beautiful stuff. Any other comments by the school board? Um, yeah. I, uh, Jenny? Sorry. Oh, I should have mentioned this earlier when we were talking about the inclusive school and neighborhood schools, but um, Vancouver, for example, uh, Vancouver School District, apparently they're not um, implementing that right now. And I guess Superintendent Phelps said that district staff believe it's still best for their students to receive the full spectrum of services available in special education. And I think maybe because they realize they don't have the staff available to implement it well, would maybe be, I don't know. He didn't go into reasons why, but. That's Steve Webb was the superintendent? I'm sorry? Steve Webb was the superintendent um, of Vancouver? Superintendent Phelps, Vancouver. Is that a deputy superintendent? Okay. Uh, well, we can look into that further. Um, Snell, I'm sorry. Oh, Steve Webb was the former superintendent. And Jeff Snell is the current superintendent. I think it was Snell. I think. Okay. I'm reading from the Columbian article, so. All right. Yes, maybe that's part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Director Gronwald, any comments? No, I don't have anything right now. Okay. Hearing nothing further. The time is 8.20 p.m. Um, the board will take a recess uh, and then reconvene in executive session to um, evaluate the performance of a public employee. Uh, that will take approximately 30 minutes, after which we will adjourn for the night. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.